so I really have to give them credit. Uh, as Brett indicated, historically, uh, as in, and when I was in training, most of these were all treated uh, in conservative means, and essentially what happened was we thought they were successfully treated by virtue of their healing. The problem was that these were all healing with a 100% malunion rate, and the issues were what that affected uh, their ultimate function. Essentially, the, the interest or the uh, intensity by which these were addressed by trauma centers was really advocated by this paper in 2005, which illustrated that perhaps we should look more closely at operatively treated fractures with respect to the return of function, and that was already illustrated by Brett. So we're going to talk briefly about the indications for plate fixation, the rationale, uh, the plate type, and then lastly, plate location, and at the end, we're going to have some cases to sort of illustrate this. Probably the rationale is best illustrated in this slide, which shows that uh, the restoration of the morphology of the clavicle really is the critical thing in respect to rest restoration of length because it provides the anterior strut or suspension for the shoulder. Uh, essentially, the glenohumeral joint can be loaded more appropriately. And by virtue of this axial load, if you have the anterior strut intact of the clavicle, it provides the control of the shoulder and restoration of this uh, tripod. Cosmetically, the fracture or the displacement of the injury characteristically gives you a local uh, deformity that you can see here, which is, was illustrated by Brett as well, where you see this proximal migration of the medial fragment. And this essentially does not resolve. Essentially, uh, it also accompanies a foreshortening of the shoulder girdle, which you can see on the, the AP view, especially on the bottom right of this patient's shoulder by virtue of the shortening. It also has a global determination in terms of how the shoulder girdle event presents because with significant shortening, which I've shown with this outline of the clavicular fragments overlapped, what happens to the rest of the shoulder is also affected. And this is really well shown in this AP chest x-ray, which shows not only that foreshortening that you can see, but also a change in the scapular thoracic orientation with respect to the contralateral side. Uh, this is really well illustrated by a superior view of the clavicle showing where the shortening occurs, and you see this where that restoration of length essentially affects that strut phenomenon that we talked about earlier. That same patient, when you look at them from the front, you can see the bump that you characteristically look at, and that's what the patient uh, is visible when you look at the frontal plane. But when you look from the back, you see the characteristic lack of the strut support of the front and this characteristic scapular winging, which is due to this anterior foreshortening of the clavicle, which essentially changes those mechanics. The key to success in this treatment uh, with plate fixation is really in some way, shape, or form providing compression across the fracture surfaces. Uh, this is essentially by providing what we call absolute stability or rigid fixation that allows primary bone healing with a minimal amount of callus, which can sometimes be detrimental to neurologic function. We've learned from the AO group that over-aggressive dissection in many other bones, including the clavicle, is fraught with complications, and that's probably why many of the more rigid plates were originally used. The idea of doing a more uh, classic uh, uh, tissue-sparing procedure would be more advocated in terms of managing, especially this injury. This is really well illustrated in a series of works and probably came to the U.S. in 1970 with the, the uh, work on the right, the Manual of Internal Fixation, which actually was initially presented in the U.S. in 1970. So we're going to talk about implants. Essentially what I think you should really think of as these implants should be tailored to the injury. The goal is rigid fixation and fracture compression. If you look at the three implants that we're currently using, uh, the reconstruction plates are the workhorse group, uh, the 27 or 35 reconstruction plate. Then there's the DCP, which has been supplanted by the LCDCP, and more recently the locking plates, which are really primarily for significant osteopenia, marked avascularity, or uh, in the presence of severe comminution. So you have to realize that the 2.7 and 3.5 millimeter reconstruction plates, which are wonderful plates to use, are essentially made uh, accessible to us as surgeons by being heat annealed by the companies that make them. This allows them to be contoured precisely in multiple planes. But unfortunately, that does create some weakening, and it's very important that these are really anchored with lag screw fixation to the implant, so the implant alone cannot hold this together. The DCPs, as uh, you can imagine, are much stiffer. They can't be contoured very easily in the sagittal plane. They can be bent through screw holes. Uh, they are essentially advocated for markedly accommodated injuries. There have been 
uh, a rash of companies now coming out with pre-contoured implants. Uh, the question is their utility. They are basically allowed to be placed superiorly, anteriorly, uh, have locking components. And the question is really, do we um, routinely use these with respect to their costs and perhaps their versatility? Uh, Jerry Wong, who's a, a, a faculty member here, actually wrote a very nice article in JBGS demonstrating, looking at a series of cadavers, how variable the clavicle is in all planes. On the left, you see the significant variety of the S-shaped curve of the clavicle, and therefore, it would be very difficult to have one plate fit all of those shapes. And then when you look from the frontal plane, you see the superior surface also changes dramatically with respect to the various clavicle shapes. So really, uh, when you take a pre-contoured plate, try to contour that to this complex shape. It's sometimes difficult to contour because these are very stiff. They're also very bulky. And if you look closely, the whole configuration does not allow you to dynamically load these fractures or compress them. So plate location is really injury specific. It should be tailored to the fracture pathoanatomy uh, and perhaps the patient specific needs. For example, if you know that they're gonna be using a backpack, perhaps you'd consider a different location for the implant. But it's really never a cookbook kind of phenomenon. Talking about superior plating, the advantages are that it's a subcutaneous approach. The, almost always you can put a lag screw through the plate. Contouring is more intuitive because you're looking directly down on this S-shaped curve and therefore you can more accurately, precisely uh, contour the implant. The disadvantages is they are prominent, especially uh, the, more, the thicker implants, and you are drilling toward the great vessels and I think the critical thing is to be very cognizant of that when you're doing this procedure. The, uh, subclavian structures that you can see are in close proximity to the clavicle. You can see the subclavian artery and vein in the plexus, and in the middle third, those are uh, right under the clavicle, and therefore, plunging with a drill would not be uh, advisable. The anterior inferior plate became more popular in the last 10 years, largely because it's ideal for the lateral third, but we've applied this to other injuries as well. It is less prominent. Uh, it's ideal for um, the DCP because it can be contoured through the plate holes to accommodate that S-shaped curve from the front. The disadvantages are that it is a soft tissue stripping procedure with respect to the deltoid anteriorly, and you have to recognize that may change your rehab protocol afterwards. And if you look, this slide showing the way the anterior deltoid wraps around the front of the clavicle on the lateral side, how that would have to be taken down to put an anterior plate on. Here's a, a well-known patient of ours who, as a bicyclist, went over his handlebars, uh, landed on his helmet, uh, cracked his helmet and had an ipsilateral scapular injury, which was relatively accommodated, as well as a scapular body fracture and a hemoneumothorax. And he was exquisitely uncomfortable in any attempt to move him because of the multiplicity of his injuries. And essentially, when he had his surgical procedure done, we essentially tailored the fixation. And as you can see, it really, this is a plate that begins anteriorly and ends superiorly because this is the best advocated for his particular fracture pathoanatomy and allowing us to put a lag screw through the plate. Here's another example for a motocross accident in a severely traumatized patient with clavicular injury, humerus, open olecranon, distal humerus fracture, as well as scapulothoracic dissociation on the left side. The right side had just a clavicle and a glenoid injury, and the patient had all of his upper extremity injuries managed, including the clavicle. The right side was not treated. He comes back to clinic two weeks later begging for fixation of his right clavicle because that's the one extremity he could not use well because of the instability that was still present. Complications are essentially uh, shown in this article really showing that this is not a benign procedure. You really have to approach this with some trepidation and really uh, understanding the pathoanatomy and how to address this appropriately. You can see that 103 patients, 24 patients had complications, which is really quite high if you think about the management of many of the other bones that we deal with. Complications uh, with inadequate fixation are usually very early failures, and they are usually because there is not a uh, solid fixation construct arrived at the end of the procedure. And here you see an example where there was no lag screw used. The distal fixation immediately becomes uh, in jeopardy, and then the deformity recurs. This was uh, managed with a completely different venue, and you can see the implant is now placed from the front because all the superior fixation was uh, not solid and this required a, a much longer implant with the anterior fixation. So briefly about operative fixation, then we'll finish. Uh, we've gone essentially away from treating these in the beach chair position to the supine position. We use an interscapular roll to allow the clavicle to become more prominent. 
we prep the, either the entire shoulder girdle or just the clavicle itself, depending on what we're anticipating intraoperatively. But the, the whole prep allows us to see the entire axis, and we always make sure that the C-arm will allow us good visualization on the AP and the 45 degrees cephalic tilt x-ray. The incision is usually interclavicular, and the idea is it's the intention of the scar is to not be on the weight-bearing surface of the clavicle. Uh, this incision involves mobilizing the supraclavicular nerves, which are present in every one of these, unless they're avulsed by the injury. And essentially, you won't need to dissect around these, and you want to minimize the stripping. This is an artist's rendition showing the supraclavicular nerves, the medial, the intermediate, and lateral supraclavicular nerves, which are draping over. On the bottom right, you see they can be quite robust, or in this case, quite diaphanous, where you have to be very careful in their dissection so that you have to slide the plate under this, uh, these various uh, overlying structures. The goal is restoration of functional anatomy. So function follows form, malfunction follows malformation. There's really no indication for using some of these uh, thinner plates, which although they do auto contour, they're not stiff enough. And the, the third tubular plates, which have been used in the past, are essentially to be uh, not used at all because of the instability that will routinely happen. Uh, this is just an example of such an injury. Here's a, a relatively minimally accommodated clavicular injury. You can see the initial uh, displacement. This was managed with a plate, and this is at one week. Uh, the patient uh, already has failure of one of the holes. There's also already the characteristic loosening on the lateral side. At two weeks, it doesn't get much better. The plate's now broken in two locations, and the deformity has recurred. This needs to be managed with more rigid fixation, and as we, uh, we talked about, some sort of lag screw fixation, if at all possible. It's important when you do revision surgery that you absolutely get a reduction in restoration of morphology. And here you see this was revised with a straight plate on the superior surface. The fracture wasn't reduced. And essentially, despite maintaining the grip of the fixation, if you look at this view, you can see although the plate is still solidly on the bone, there's a persistent nonunion and essentially a malalignment of the injury and chronic pain. This was managed purely by removing the implant, restoring the length of the clavicle, getting a primary fracture line where you could put a lag screw through the plate, and the ultimate fixation was a plate that was placed from the top with two lag screws through the, the in this case, non-union. This just shows from this inferior view the importance of the multiplanar shaping that's necessary for clavicular uh, superior plate placement, and it's really possible with these reconstruction plates. In, in rehabilitation, you need to have stability that allows active assisted range of motion or passive range of motion with gravity eliminated or Codman exercises and the patient needs to have the confidence to be able to do this. Uh, otherwise, they can't recur, re recover the function that you'd ideally like them to have. So in summary, you have to have a good pre-op plan uh, to avoid pitfalls, a careful exposure and dissection that's predicated on the pathoanatomy of the injury, dynamically loaded fixation so that you have enough stability following the reconstruction to allow a functional aftercare so the patient can use their arm. Failures are usually the surgical method and really are not patient error. So we're going to go on now with Winston who will talk to us about intermedullary fixation. Thank you very much and good morning. That was an excellent review on the clavicle fracture management over the years and also an excellent talk on plating. We'd like to move on to intermedullary fixation. As Brett mentioned, there have been multiple different tools that have been used over time to fix clavicles, going back to K-wires, which are just straight wires, and Knowles pins have uh, the ability to tighten down a little nut. Uh,